This looks like any typical suburban backyard. But you know, here in Michigan, I keep saying we have so much fishing in our own backyard that it's incredible. We're, we're here at St. Clair Shores. There are more recreational boats per nautical mile, per square mile, per linear mile than any place in the world. Right here, every other street on this side of Jefferson Avenue has a canal like this loaded with boats. In fact, this lake that we're going to be fishing on, Lake St. Clair, is one of the top musky waters in the world. Maybe not for trophy muskies, but the number of muskies that come out of here exceed any other body of water. Right, Dennis? I'd say so, Fred, without a doubt. Okay. Well, Dennis Bitt of Gary ought to know. He's a charter captain for many years on Lake St. Clair, and he's taken many musky. Almost every day he gets one. Another fellow who does equally well is Joe Breyer. He's a charter captain double teaming with Dennis. We're also having Greg Golab as our crew. He's the manager of Lakeview Tackle, a veteran on Lake St. Clair. The goal, catch Ed Bedwell, his first muskie. Ed's from Stroh's. We wanted to make this a special day from him. Well, we gave it the best shot we could, Bob Garner and I. I want you to join us and stay tuned for this muskie fishing story because it's Thursday night, time for Michigan Outdoors. This is, uh, this is our array of baits. Basically, we have all believers. Our lures are from six inch jointed right up to the 10 inch. Here we go. Here we go, Ed. A That's 10 inch. A reverse crackle. A reverse crackle. This is what we troll in the water. Get a hold of that. I bet you've kept fish that were smaller than that. Possibly. <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> I have all the time. I'll tell you, what is it about a lure like this that's trolled through the water that attracts musky? Why, th this lure, this believer lure, by the way, was developed in St. Clair Shores. Right in this area and is probably the most predominant lure that muskie fishermen use on Lake St. Clair. Right, I believe in the last tournament, the last first six fish were caught on the believer lure. The reason for that is the deviation of it. What do you mean the deviation? The lure works straight and will deviate out to the left and out to the right. You tune the bait by bringing the eye in. If the bait's running off to the right like this, you'd bring the center eye in to tune the bait. You always tune a bait every time you put it in the water. Okay, and what do you want? Maximum wiggle? You want maximum wiggle plus your deviation. Tuned okay? Oh, yeah. See how it's running straight there? Mm-hmm. See the deviation there, Fred? I was telling you. Kicks, kicks over every now and then. Right. Okay. The two sizes here are the 8-inch and the 10-inch. And right down to the 7-fred, uh, and right down to the 6-inch. Now, will the 10-inch catch bigger musky than this? I mean, why would you use the bigger bait over the smaller bait, or vice versa? It depends a lot on the muskie per day, just like colors. Colors. Could, yesterday was very good with the jailbird here. You reverse crackle. This is a new color out that did real well. Mm -hmm. Now today, with the darker day, we'd be using darker baits probably. Your dark frog, your perch, more of your natural colors. And your... So you're switching the sinkers to get it right. right. Just That'll give us our position so we won't tangle. To run this amount of rods, uh, we're running just basically all different weights. And so our, our lines are different, and our, our depths are different, and our, how far we're running the rods back. Our farthest one will be 35 feet, though, back. OK, when you have that rod in your hand, Ed, that fish is fighting. Which, what's your strategy? Well, I want to say real like crazy, but I guess you play it, if, depending on how big it is. What, what I, I'm a novice at this, Fred, so I'm, I'm well, here. But I know you're a bass fisherman. You've well, bass fishermen, you know, for bass fishing, I just keep the line tight and try to get them out of the weeds because most of them are, the bigger bass are in the weeds. But muskie is going to be a new story. What, what are you going to be doing, Coach? When <laughs> well, I'll be telling them what to do uh, when he gets the fish on, uh, myself or Dennis here. And uh, all he has to do is just keep the line tight. And uh, don't try to horse the fish. Uh, let, let the fish go ahead and make his run. And uh, the muskie is a very cagey fish when he gets up alongside the boat. They may come in very easily. And uh, when they get to the back of the boat, that's uh, sometimes when you got to really be on the ball because they will make a quick run or a fast dart. And if you're not ready for that, you could possibly lose the muskie. So you've got to be paying attention all the time. Okay, we're going to take one last rehearsal here on okay. that rod right there, Ed. That's the one. Grab it. There we go. Hey, he's getting better. This is not the easiest thing to do, Fred. <laughs> do you feel well enough rehearsed? Well, I think so. What is the trolling speed here? We're moving. We're doing about four knots. There we go. Back the point. Okay. Oh, I tell you. Huh? <laughs> That's work. <laughs> and we haven't even got a fish yet. No. Okay. It's, it's tough pulling that line out, pulling that pole up 
without a fish on it, I imagine it's going to be real tough when you get something on there. We'll be heading to the dumps today. The dumps sounds great, doesn't it? It really sounds great. <laughs> why, Dennis, why the dumps? Uh, the sea can is probably the most famous marker in the world for muskies. We'll be close, fishing close to that and the F marker. The reason they call us the dumping grounds is where they dumped all the dirt from the freighter channels. The deepest part of this lake is 22 feet and they had to dredge the entire channel here. So this is why they call us the dumping grounds. But we have a lot of ridges in that area. We work in 10 to 17 feet of water. There'll be a lot of bait fish in there, a lot of walleyes perch, and that's why the muskies are in there this time of year. There's a beauty. We got a good one right there. There's a big fish right up there. It's a big one? Here, we can stop it. Put your finger again. Right there. See him. How big would that be? That fish right there is probably about 20 pounds, at least 20 pounds. What's been your best day? My best day, I've had 59 in boat at nine. 15 in boat at nine? Right. That's and great. And three double headers. Everybody says that it takes 60 to 100 hours to catch a, a muskie. In fact, I've even heard somebody say to me, well, you have to go out on a charter boat 60 hours to catch one. No, that's, they're talking per rod. So if we have like eight rods out, you're talking 10 hours on your average. Oh, okay. But we usually always get a hit pretty well, unless the water conditions today is good. We got a good dark app, overcast day. Not many floating weeds, and the water is relatively clear. And we're going to the right area, and you got about the prime time of the year, July. Well, the conditions looked right, but we did have a problem. Uh, we thought maybe it was King Neptune. So we did the good luck ritual of paying off King Neptune over the shoulder with some pennies. See if that would work. Uh, we resorted to doing such things as talking to the fish down through the rods. Sometimes that brings us good luck. But Mother Nature wasn't even kind. We had rain, all kinds of problems that day, but we paid our dues and put in the hours nonetheless. Well, that rod has been what it's been doing all day. I mean, it's been there for about uh, almost 10 hours, nine hours. Pretty close. It's been doing a fine job, hadn't it? Oh, yeah, it's staying right there. And that was the rod that you were supposed to grab with the muskie on it. That was the rod. We have been watching that rod <laughs> religiously. What do you think about musky fishing so far? It's exciting. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I don't know if that's overstating it a little bit. It really isn't that bad, though. I mean, we gave it a good shot. Oh, we? yeah. Now, you, do you believe now, Ed, that it does take 80 hours to catch a musky? I believe now, yeah. OK, Ed, we have, uh, we have 71 hours to go. Did you bring a lunch? <laughs> no. <laughs> we were all real optimistic. Maybe that was a problem. Well, I don't know. What do you think the problem was? That's musky fishing. We could go out tomorrow and get six or seven, and then again, we could get one here right as we're pulling lines in. That's one thing about musky yeah. fishing. You never really know. But you know, Ed, the type of musky we wanted to get you. We had a fellow on the show. You remember the guy who caught that 41-pounder? Oh, no. oh, do I? That was a great fish. Oh, Imagine being, the being the one to hold that fish. Yeah. What's it like to catch a 41-pounder? Oh, I, it's unbelievable. I just, when we, we didn't see it when we first, you know, got him, and we didn't really know. I knew I had a big fish on, but just didn't know how big. But when we saw him, once we first saw him, then we realized it was a big one. And I didn't have him hooked very good either. I just had him hooked on the left there. And how long did it take to bring him in? Uh, I don't. I'm guessing 15 or 20 minutes. I'm not real sure. Oh, yeah, it could have been longer. Did he come out of the water at all? He probably uh, couldn't. No, never did. Nope. He went right for deep water and. Then, like I say, we got him about six feet from the boat when we first saw him, and, and that's when he was coming up. I, he just, he headed right for deep water. Well, I tell you, this fish is gonna be- Looking at a fish like that, Ed, does that look like it's worth it to hang in here? Sure. I mean, it is something if, that- If someone could make a promise that you could get a 41 pounder, I'd fish all day and all night. Okay. I think most everybody here would do that. Well, you know, I, I wanna talk to Greg here. Greg, sure, back at Lakeview, in the, in the tackle shop there, you have a tank of fish. You got pike, walleye, rock bass, bluegill, perch, all kinds of things in there. And these are fish that were caught around here? Yeah, they were caught all by us around Lakeview Tackle. Dennis got the bass, and we picked up the pike and uh, the perch, pretty much everything in there. Okay, now, once or twice a day, you feed those fish. You drop minnows in there. Sure. Now, I think we can learn something from watching fish like that. Uh, Joe, as we were watching this, what happened when those minnows hit the water? Did all the fish start eating? Not all at one time, but, uh, you know, they'll slowly creep up on them and, and 
grab them that way. But uh, certain times of the day, they'll, uh, they'll feed more aggressively than others. Well, we know from looking at the graph that we were dragging these believers, eight of them, at a time over musky. Sure. The whole time, you know, you're going to find them coming in and out of the screen. There's a lot of times that you go over those screens, too, and you don't mark anything. There's fish around there. Uh, we had problems, too, today. The water was a little bit dirtier out in the mm -hmm. dumps there, and it made it a little bit tougher. But looking at the tank, though, with the fish swimming around with that bait, just because they have the best-looking bait in the world go by doesn't mean that they're going to hit it at the time. That's exactly right. Uh, that's why it takes a tremendous amount of hours and your time to put in. Uh, tomorrow is another day. We might come out here tomorrow and uh, drag for two or three hours and catch four or five fish or two or three. Mm -hmm. It just depends. Every day is different out here. That's the story. Okay, I got to admit it. You saw it. The Michigan Outdoors trip where we not only got skunked, but we never got one hit the whole day. And you know, Joe Breyer said every day is different. Right here in Lake St. Clair, the following day, this was on Tuesday, we got a call at 10 in the morning from Greg Golab, and he had been talking to Dennis out in the boat. Dennis had a triple header on. Three muskies the following day, the same places we were fishing, the same lures, the same strategies, a triple header. They lost the biggest one. They landed the 17-pounder on a smaller one. That's the way it goes when you go fishing. We did the best we could to bring it to you. Hopefully next week and other, other fishing stories will be able to bring home the bacon. But uh, that's the way it goes musky fishing. You can bet we're going to be out there again trying it. Now for the forecast for this weekend. Fred, there are no guarantees in fishing. We all know that. But there is a guarantee that a major ballot proposal will show up on this November's ballot. And that will be the proposal to put the Camer Act, the Camer Recreational Land Trust Fund Act, that takes the royalties from gas and oil across the state and buys recreational lands with it. Well, there is a guarantee that that will be on the ballot for sportsmen and women all over the state of Michigan to approve or disapprove. Right now, it stands as the only ballot item. You know, the legislature has rated that fund many times over the past eight years. Maybe this will finally give us a chance to put it in the Constitution and protect it for all time. And good news uh, this week is we got our first moose from Ontario. We're expecting about 30 moose over the next uh, three-year period period. They will be planted up around Lake Michigami and the Barriga Marquette County border up in uh, the northern part of the Upper Peninsula. And this week's Stroh's Michigan Outdoors report centers around a major wildlife restoration project to restore and increase Michigan's wood duck populations. Well, that takes a lot of time and hard work. Recently, members of the Wayne Waterfall chapter of the Michigan Duck Hunters Association were able to put together their time and workers and a grant from the Stroh Michigan Outdoors Fund to build wood duck nesting boxes. These boxes are placed over water in marsh settings to encourage nesting. The Wayne Waterfall chapter has placed over 400 of these boxes in wetland habitat over the past five years. While wood ducks are the more likely ducks to use the nesting boxes, other species such as golden eyes, buffleheads, and mergansers are also common tenants of these man-made homes. And how successful are these nesting boxes? Well, duck hunters and biologists are quick to note that this type of program has been partly responsible for bringing the wood duck from a scarce and seldom seen Michigan duck to one that is now a common sight throughout the state. And that rates a hearty thank you from this duck hunter to the Wayne chapter of the Michigan Duck Hunters Association. Well, we're happy that the Wayne Waterfowlers and all the other clubs that have taken their Stroh Grant money and done these conservation projects, we're so glad to see what they've done. We're going to have a lot more coming up in the future. We're going to report on all 51 of them. All right. How about some mailbag letters, Ed? All right. Here's one from Homer. If the law passes to allow us to use our handguns to hunt deer, will we be able to use our black powder handguns? Good question. We get asked this quite a bit. What about it, Bob? I think he means muzzleloading handgun. And no, those are not legal right now, and they will not be legal if this bill passes. Only repeating handguns will be allowed. And I will say one thing. Many of you have asked over the last couple of weeks, where does this bill stand? Well, this bill is actually sitting right now, and it's sitting right smack dab in the Natural Resources Committee, chaired by uh, Senator Kirby Holmes from Macomb County. It's sitting right there and has not moved through the Senate, even though it's passed the House. There is still time for that bill to be implemented by this November, but unless, well, so long as Senator Holmes finally puts it's it on the agenda lap. and passes, or gets it through his committee. So sportsmen who want to get that passed, put the heat on Senator Kirby Holmes, because he's the key. Here's Next another question. question. Recently, while fishing in Bluff Lake in Clare County, we found the lake itself didn't look quite right. The water was discolored, the kids who went swimming in the lake were getting pink eye, and all the fish we caught and cleaned had black spots all through the meat. 
Someone was brave enough to eat some of the meat and got really sick from them. Could you please try to find out what can be wrong and how to try to do something about this problem? It's what you call typical summer lake panic. I guess that's all we can call it. The DNR and the public health department gets questions like this all the time throughout the summer. Frankly, there are a series of coincidences. Because those black spots couldn't have caused any health problems. The pink eye, well, that's from kids opening their eyes underwater. Discoloration could be from the weather we've had and the turbulence. Uh, the lake looks funny. Well, there's just a lot of algae blooms and things that happen, but not one of these cases, including Bluff Lake, that's been reported, has, has been found to have any problem at all in the lake. So that's the good news. The bad news is that Bluff Lake and Claire got some bad publicity, <laughs> but that's all it is is publicity. Right. So don't worry about mm -hmm. it. Here's a letter from Manistique. I'm wondering about a simple method for an average guy out in the brush to tell the difference between the northern pike, muskellunge, and tiger muskie. I would hate to be caught with an undersized muskie by mistake. Boy, I would have loved to have been caught with an undersized muskie <laughs> Monday. Any kind of muskie. Me too, me too. The basic difference to tell between a pike and a muskie, look at a, this uh, illustration. The northern pike on top has white bean-shaped spots against a dark body. On the bottom is a muskie. It could be a northern muskie, a tiger muskie, or a Great Lakes muskie. You're going to have dark markings, either bars or maybe some little dots against a lighter background. That's the main difference. There's one more if you take a photograph and look at these, what they're called mandibular or sensory pores underneath the fish's jaw right there. There are five or less on a northern pike. There are six or more of these on each side on a muskie. That's the best way to tell. It's simple. Just look at, remember the coloration. That's the best. And now, another question about fishing and fish coming up in our outdoor quiz. Everybody knows what this is. That's Kathy Beitler simmering some onions <laughs> in butter, sautéing them. Easy recipe. <laughs> we have a recipe which is called... Musky Creole. Musky Creole. We're going to call it Pike Creole today for obvious reasons. <laughs> the northern pike works just as well, and I think you're going to like this one. A medium onion chopped up finely and sautéed along with... Two cups of tomatoes. Stewed tomatoes or just canned. One can will do it. It's exactly two cups. Stir those around, and now what do we add? We have some marjoram in here. Mm -hmm. We're going to put a little of that. Just a dash. A dash? A little that bit enough? more. A little bit more? That's a good okay. dash. Okay. This recipe, by the way, just calls for dashes and dabs. Now what? Some parsley, chopped. A couple teaspoons or a teaspoon. And that looks like a garlic. Minced, minced garlic clove. Mm -hmm. You can see already we're going to add a little zing to this recipe. We have something else here, some allspice. Yeah, it's different. Like cloves. You could use cloves as well, but uh, you, you have to season this to taste. How's that? A little bit more. A little bit more? Yep. Okay, there's okay. allspice. Salt and pepper, you want to add those, Kathy? Okay. While I add the other ingredients, and the next thing we're going to put in here, we're going to simmer this for a little bit and add the juice of a half of a lemon. Just squeeze it right in there. Salt, pepper, marjoram, allspice, juice a of lemon. half a lemon. Parsley, uh, here we have red cayenne pepper. Oh, I like this. We have to put a lot of this in, don't we, Kat? No, we don't. That's oh, good. I think I think we have to That's put a lot dash. in there. A good dash. And some white wine, some good Michigan wine. Ooh, there's the fun part. We're going to put about a half a cup or so. Put it in about <laughs> like dash. that. Huh? A dash, a dash of that too. And now for the pike or muskie. This is the part that is important because pike and muskie both have a series of bones you can, I don't know if you can see them here, but I can sure feel them. They come off the rib bones and the backbone, and they cause problems. You want to cut those out in these chunks of fish that we're going to use. So you get chunks of fish like this. You could leave the skin on if it was scaled like this, right, mm -hmm. Kat? Yeah, I would. <laughs> simmer this for how long? Uh, this is going to simmer for 20 minutes. It looks good, smells good, and then we're going to add some pike to it and mm -hmm. have our recipe. But to look for some musky, we have to go right now to our <laughs> trophy report. Muskies are caught in big waters all over Michigan. Here's one from Manuskong Bay in the UP that hit a daredevil earlier this year for Paul Cook of Lima, Ohio. That muskie weighed 23 pounds, 4 ounces. And look at this one, 49 inches long, 32 and a half pounds, caught on a crawler harness also in Manuskong Bay. Franklin Brown from Grand Rapids was fishing for walleye. Bet this monster gave him quite a jolt. 
A tiger muskie is a cross between a Great Lakes or northern muskie and a northern pike, and here's one taken from Kingston Lake in Alger County. It went 26 pounds even, 49 inches long, and it hit a daredevil which Paul Cook from Manistique was trolling in mid-June. Now this tiger muskie weighed 22 and a half pounds. It was caught in Allegan County's Dumont Lake on a Sacramento. Bernie Holloman's from Moline was the lucky angler. Northern pike are generally a little more common and easier to catch than muskies, and here's an unusually large one for Michigan. 30 pounds, 6 ounces, 44 inches long. Matt Rourke from Irons caught it on a homemade plug from Big Bass Lake in Lake County. I wonder if we'll see his homemade plug on the market sometime soon. You know, it's always nice to see a lady catch a master angler fish, like Janice French from Lansing, who was casting a rapala in Portage River up in Houghton County. 22 pounds, 2 ounces, 46 inches long. That pike was caught just three weeks ago tomorrow. And closing out our trophy report is another lucky lady angler, Lorenda Sue Hensel from Interlochen, who caught this 19 and a half pound Atlantic salmon last July 10th in Platte Bay. Atlantic salmon aren't too common, and this was the second largest of 1983, reason enough to make Lorenda Sue our Michigan Outdoors Master Angler of the Week. Here is the, well, it's musky creole, but it's really pike creole this time. There you go, Bob. I'll take Ed, it. Ed, try that. I will. You haven't had this before, but we cooked mm -hmm. it in the office for Bob. Ooh. Isn't it good? This is delicious. It is delicious. <laughs> it isn't fishy at all. It doesn't even taste like fish. The fish, I think, is just a... Well, you know, it, stewed tomatoes are not my favorite uh, delicacy, but... All the spices. Mm, great stuff. I'd right have on. a hard time throwing back a muskie with this recipe. This is great. Yeah, I think, frankly, you could use almost any kind of fish in this. Don't I you, would. Kathy? Mm -hmm. This is musky creole. It's in Kay Ritchie's book, Savor the Wild, and it's also in our Club Digest. Uh, now, don't worry, Club Digest is on the presses this weekend, and it should be in your hands by next weekend, going out in the mail. Mm -hmm. And that'll answer that. We'll have this recipe plus all the others for the next two months. Our outdoor fair is just around the corner, and it's going to be great. Now, if you missed last year's fair, it's where we bring together all kinds of fishing, hunting, and shooting sports exhibits for you to see. The indoor exhibitors, the fishing lure companies, the taxidermists, bow and arrow manufacturers and the like are all housed inside Houghton Lake High School. Outside, you can find muzzleloader villages, Berkeley speed casting competitions, silhouette shoots, dog training demonstrations, and more, including the Flint Bowman's archery shoots with hand-painted targets, novelty shoots, and a Golden Arrow 3D shoot that Fred gave a try not too long ago. Right through here. Okay, you can see with the camera, this is the type of shots that we're going to have up there. The outdoor fair, and I got to put the arrow through there and try to score on the vital areas. This is a lot of fun. You're also going to have uh, some sitting shots, and there'll be yeah. sitting shots and kneel shots also, Fred. Okay. Oh, nice. Well, we'll see how it goes. And that's I'll hit the styrofoam, and I'll try to hit him right in the vital area. Nice shot. Nice shot. Nice shot. Huh? Okay. okay. Good score. Good. See what the score is. You get one shot per one shot per target. Okay, look at this. Complete with real area. live antlers. Here, and this is called the Golden Arrow 3D. Let's take a look and see what you got here. Pull the arrow out. Well, what do you think? You got a partial lung and liver. Okay, what, what would that score? Nice shooting, Fred. All this is happening Friday through Sunday, August 3rd through the 5th, at the Fish Factory, Houghton Lake. The outdoor fair is going to be fantastic. I hope to see you there. Next week, I'm not going to be here. Well, I am going to be here if you watch your television sets. I am going to be fishing up in the Sylvania Tract for smallmouth and largemouth bass up in the Upper Peninsula. Some great fishing up there, but it's a vacation show. So we're going to do it a little bit early. I'm going to be spending my week at Houghton Lake covering every 22,000 acres up there that they have. Fishing, water skiing, and having a good time. I hope to see you right here next week. Have an enjoyable one. See you on Michigan Outdoors. Here we are, the Believer fishing team. You a believer, Ed? I'd like to be. <laughs> <laughs> like to be. Well, you know what time it is? It's time to pull the lines. Right. We put our dues in. Well, let's go to it, guys. Let's pull the lines up here. We can always catch a muskie as we're pulling the lines. We don't know. There's always that chance. Go ahead, Ed. Shank it right out of there. Sometimes when you do pull the lines in, we're adding a little extra motion to them. No, I guess we don't have anything so far right here. Well, what do you think, though, Joe? This Was this a wasted trip? Did we let our viewers down? No, we did not. 
because this is musky fishing. And mus this is what musky fishing is all about on Lake St. Clair. It's an exciting day regardless if you catch a musky or you don't catch a musky. That's the way I feel about it. Every day is different, and all, all of us love the fish, so this is our penance. We pay our penance. Tomorrow's another day.